Tonight, a state going backwards on abortion, reviving laws from the time of the American Civil War. But is Arizona alone or simply a sign of things to come? We'll look at the resurrection of a 160-year-old law repealing women's rights and threatening abortion providers with five years in prison. Both Democrats and Republicans have expressed outrage with Donald Trump telling the state it's gone too far. Mr. President, did Arizona go too far? Did Arizona go too far? Yeah, they did, and that'll be straightened out. And uh, as you know, it's all about states' rights. And Trump is just one of a growing number of Republicans raising the alarm, but isn't this what they've wanted? We'll break it down for you. Also on the program, Israel kills the three sons of Hamas's political leader. Ismail Haniya says the Israeli airstrike that killed his children was launched in the spirit of revenge and murder. Plus, is Julian Assange close to release? President Biden reveals he's now considering a request to drop the prosecution of the WikiLeaks founder. As a new report says the so-called zombie drug has arrived in the UK, we look at its devastating impact in the United States. And Russ Cook, also known as the hardest geezer who ran across Africa, joins me live in the studio. That's all coming up on The World with me, Yalda Hakim. Good evening. In the state of Arizona, people are in a state of shock. They're coming to terms with the fact that the Supreme Court just gave the green light to the return of a law dating back 160 years that will ban nearly all abortions. The move has been described as a disaster for women and a draconian decision. After all, when that law was made, the state of Arizona wasn't even a state. In reality, it means abortion will only be allowed if the mother's life is in jeopardy. There will be no exceptions for victims of rape or incest. For doctors, there's fear. During their court ruling, the justices said physicians are now on notice, with criminal penalties possible for those who provide abortions. Tonight, I'll explain just how the law was resurrected. It's not just shocked ordinary people, but politicians too, and on both sides of the aisle. Democrats and Republicans say they're against the decision. Donald Trump included. You might be wondering why. Wasn't this what Republicans have been working towards for decades? Well, in a moment, I'll be joined live by our US correspondent, Martha Kellner, to ask if the political winds are really shifting or whether this is all just about winning votes. But first, here's my take on how we got here. The state of Arizona just revived a ban on nearly all abortions under a law dating back to 1864. A time when women didn't have the vote, the country was at civil war and Arizona wasn't even a state. It's prompted a major no. backlash. This is going to criminalize doctors for doing their jobs and it's going to have a devastating effect on the health and freedom of women in Arizona. So how and why has Arizona gone back 160 years? Well, the old law has never actually been repealed. But in 1973, shortly after the landmark Roe v. Wade decision guaranteeing the constitutional right to an abortion, a court in Tucson blocked the 1864 law. Then, when the US Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in 2022, the then Arizona Attorney General, a Republican, convinced a state judge to lift an injunction blocking its enforcement. Since then, there's been months of legal wrangling about whether the old law could be enforced after years of dormancy. Last August, Arizona's top court agreed to review the case under pressure from a right-wing law firm, Alliance Defending Freedom. And on Tuesday, in a 4-2 ruling, Arizona's state Supreme Court said the 1864 law was now enforceable because there were no federal or state protections for the procedure. So the debate over abortion rights back in the headlines and sure to be a major issue heading into the election. Could this time be different, though? And I asked the question about whether this time things could be different because Republicans, even in the state of Arizona, are now saying they don't back the decision. And while the presidential nominee, Donald Trump, is also, uh, it seems, changing his tune, just take a listen to what he said in 2016 during an interview. What should the law be on abortion? Well, I, I, I have been pro-life. Do you believe you... in punishment for abortion, yes or no, as a principle? Uh, the answer is that there has to be some form of punishment. For the woman? Yeah, there has to be some form. 
So you just heard him there say there has to be some form of punishment uh, for the women. Now, compare that with the statement released just this week. This 50-year battle over Roe v. Wade took it out of the federal hands and brought it into the hearts, minds, and vote of the people in each state it was really something. Now it's up to the states to do the right thing. Like Ronald Reagan, I am strongly in favor of exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. Now, he said that states should decide, claims Trump. Uh, but then, today, this rebuttal to the state of Arizona. Have a listen. Mr. President, did Arizona go too far? Did Arizona go too far? Yeah, they did, and that'll be straightened out. And uh, as you know, it's all about states' rights. That'll be straightened out. And I'm sure that the governor and everybody else are going to bring it back into reason, and that will be taken care of, I think, very quickly. So there we are, Trump saying they've now gone too far. Well, it's not the first instance uh, of Trump flip-flopping on abortion. So what's going on? Is he and the Republicans really softening their stance? Or is it simply electioneering ahead of going to the polls in November? Well, let's bring in our US correspondent, Martha Kellner. M Martha, I mean, there's so many issues that we can talk about this evening. And just first of all, Trump's flip-flopping and those statements that we heard him say even just a few hours ago. Yeah, I think it's remarkable, Yalda, to see how the Republican Party is shifting its stance on abortion. We've previously heard Donald Trump celebrating the fact that he's uh, the most anti-abortion president in recent times, uh, celebrating his role in the overturning of Roe versus Wade, that, uh, that ruling that gave uh, women the constitutional right to choose. He has celebrated the fact that he was part of uh, shifting the Supreme Court to, to the right. He was part of instilling uh, conservative-leaning justices in that court, which allowed Roe versus Wade to be overturned in the first place. Well, now we see him completely doing a 180 on that today, saying he wouldn't support, if elected, a federal ban on abortion. Uh, I think perhaps the most emblematic person of the Republican Party's shifting stance on abortion is Carrie Lake. She was the uh, Republican gubernatorial candidate uh, in Arizona in 2022. She was ultimately unsuccessful. But in the run-up uh, to in, in her campaign, uh, then she called this law, this 1864 Arizona law, a great law. Well, now she's saying it's completely wrong and that it's out of step with what Arizonans want. So I think we can see uh, the Republican Party really running scared uh, of these abortion laws. Yeah, running scared because it's issues like this that, that galvanises the, the, the Democrats and, and they know that their supporters will come out in, in droves just as they did during the, the 2022 midterms. Yeah, I think we saw in those 2022 midterm elections, Yalda, just how much abortion is a driving force in bringing people to the ballot box. And the Democratic Party know that. They're seizing upon this almost immediately. President Biden uh, was asked today if he had a message to Arizonan women uh, in light of this ruling. And he said, my message is vote for me because I'm in the 21st century. He actually made a small fluff and said the 20th century, but he meant I'm in the 21st century. And I think the Democratic Party know that this is something that will bring people to the polls and particularly in states like Arizona. Arizona is a, a swing state. It's vitally important uh, to candidates on both sides. And we can see that by how they're structuring their campaigning around this. Kamala Harris, the vice president, will go to Arizona on Friday, she will say, look, if you don't want these sort of laws, then you need to vote for the Democratic Party in this year's elections. And um, so I think we can see that this is not just a, an issue around abortion. This is a vitally important uh, political issue alongside uh, immigration and the economy. It is one of the three most important decisive factors uh, in this year's general election, almost certainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Martha, as you say, it's such a polarising issue. And, and it's all good and well for Donald Trump to say that he is in the 21st century. But the fact remains now, in Arizona, we may see uh, the enforcement of a law that's 160 years old. You know, it, it's quite extraordinary, actually, when you think about it. Arizona wasn't even a state when this law was in place. Yeah, like you say, Arizona, not even a state. And I think that is what's angered so many people, the fact that uh, this zombie law uh, that's been dormant for so many years should replace a, a law that was written 
in modern times. Arizona was home to around 7,000 people uh, back then. It's now home to more than 7 million people. It is a completely uh, different place, a completely different landscape now. And I think that's why you've seen such anger um, among pro-choice campaigners. Uh, just to give people an idea of what this will mean, after Roe versus Wade was overturned in 2022, uh, Arizonans had the right to access abortion up to 15 weeks uh, of pregnancy. So there were already restrictions, but this makes it a heck of a lot more restrictive. This it is effectively a, a total ban on abortion, except in cases where the mother's life is at risk. Of course, women can travel to neighbouring states which have uh, more abortion-friendly laws, places like California, uh, like Nevada. But many women don't have the financial means or the ability, you know, they have childcare commitments, uh, existing childcare commits, commitments, which mean they can't leave the state. So as with all of these draconian abortion laws, they do discriminate against the poorest in society as well. Martha, um, yeah, really, really interesting um, sort of conversation and debate. And no doubt we'll continue to talk about this as we get closer to the election. Thank you so much for bringing us up to date. Let's try now and uh, get a deeper understanding of how polarised this debate is. Let's bring in my guest now, Professor Aziza Ahmed, the co-director of the Boston University Programme on Reproductive Justice, who is pro-choice. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us, uh, Aziza, here on the programme. I mean, there are many women reeling and, and deeply concerned uh, about this uh, abortion law that, that could be enforced in Arizona. I, I mean, we're just talking about about it now with my correspondent. Um, it, it was, you know, enforced 160 years ago and, and we could see it come back. Yeah, it's shocking. I think it's shocking to everyone that we've arrived at this point in time where women's health is being, uh, being essentially ignored, that women will likely die, that women will sacrifice their lives for um, uh, this, um, this movement of, uh, that, that's simply tossing women under the bus. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess, you know, we, we've also been speaking to uh, people who are pro-life and they uh, are sort of sticking with this and, and saying that it's incredibly important to them. Having said that, we've also now seen, you know, the Republican Party, uh, Donald Trump flipping and flopping and, and now saying this is this has gone too far. Well, you know, the Republican Party, I think, at some level realizes, and I think conservatives at some level realize that actually people do care about their mothers, they care about their sisters, they care about their daughters, and, you know, they don't want to sacrifice their lives, their, their family members, the women in their life who might be pregnant. Um, and so even though they've taken this hard moral position and that they're fighting for a fetal personhood, it's not going to play well. And it's it's definitely not going to play well in reality once people are actually being injured. So they are having a hard time holding the line because they realize that the line they're holding is truly cruel. And I mean, when we talk about cruelty, just talk about the impact on women, especially disadvantaged women, because we could find women driving, uh, you know, across the country in an attempt to get uh, an abortion. Uh, you know, others uh, that won't get the, the right sort of advice from, from doctors and healthcare workers because they feel under threat as well. They, they potentially face imprisonment. Exactly. So physicians are often afraid to provide healthcare services in these contexts. This leaves women, you know, at the whim, uh, often of, of the general counsel of the hospital and, and lawyers for hospitals tend to be extremely cautious in advising against any risky procedures that could lead to lawsuits. Um, and we've already seen in states like Texas that women are being harmed by these extremely draconian, these old abortion laws that are being put into effect again, um, you know, and we know, and the Supreme Court has recognized, you know, Justice Sotomayor, the dissenting justices in Dobbs, they recognize that poor women are essentially going to be, um, uh, are going to suffer and that women around the country are going to be forced to carry pregnancies that they don't want to carry. And, and we're, we're create, we, we're living in a new world where, where, um, where judges and um, state officials are essentially forcing people to remain pregnant. Aziza uh, Ahmed, we'll have to leave it there, but thank you very much for joining us uh, on the program. And uh, I'd just like to let our audiences know that we were uh, hoping to speak to someone who uh, is pro-life, uh, but unfortunately that interview fell through. Now, the political leader of Hamas has 
accused Israel of acting in the spirit of revenge and murder after three of his children and three grandchildren were killed in an airstrike. The Israeli Defence Forces say they uh, targeted Ismail Haniyeh because they were terrorists. Uh, the strike came as Palestinians across Gaza were marking the end of the holy Muslim month of Ramadan with no respite from fighting in the region. Eid is typically a joyful day for Muslims around the globe, but for many in Gaza this year, it's a day of mourning amongst fears that Benjamin Netanyahu could still send troops into Rafah. Our Middle East correspondent Alistair Bunkle reports from Jerusalem. In East Jerusalem, just before dusk, the Iftar cannon was prepared for the final time this year. The explosion echoed across the city. And Palestinians broke the fast for the last time on one of the most subdued holy months in memory. It's not like other years. We're getting by without celebrations. In Gaza, the fighting continued like any other day over the last six months. As Ramadan was drawing to a close, dozens were killed. These children were rushed by ambulance to hospital. Today, the Israeli military confirmed it had killed three of Ismail Haniyeh's sons in Gaza City. This is the moment the Hamas leader found out. Haniyeh lives in exile in Doha. He said Israel is deluded if they think that this would put pressure on Hamas to agree a deal. Even in Gaza, amid the darkness of war, the colour and joy of Eid can bring a brief respite from months of fighting. This festival is a moment for families and a time to mark the end of a month of fasting. But in Gaza this Ramadan, families have been torn apart and the decision to eat or not wasn't always a choice when hundreds of thousands were starving. At this school in Rafa, where hundreds are sheltering, some of the men dressed as clowns to entertain the children. I do my best to try and bring back their smiles and joy in their hearts. Six months of war has removed any innocence of youth, but the sight of Bugs Bunny can still bring a smile to a small face. Asha is 12. Her father was killed in the war. This is their first Eid without him. I lost my dad and I lost my cousin. I wish I could see them. I want to be happy and go back to having joy in our lives. I want to go back to my home. We want the old days back. We were living happy, well fed, we had water. Now we have nothing at all, at all. Fadia fries her children some aubergine slices on a stove outside their small tent. The memory of past Eids are of no comfort now. We stayed in our homes, we had the best food and drink and gave our kids delicious meals with meat and took them to the fun fair. We made cake, sweet treats, coffee and our loved ones would visit. Our happiness was so much more than this, nothing like this extremely difficult situation. Yet again, hopes of a ceasefire are fading and the prospect of more fighting and more killing lies ahead. If Eid has given some in Gaza even a short moment of escapism, a brief chance to forget war, then it is only that, brief. And Ali joins me now. And Ali, as you say, um, you know, the respite, uh, the, the uh, moment of some kind of uh, peace for the people of Gaza, if it's Eid, as you say, it's brief. But I just, before we go into um, Eid in Gaza and, and across the region, I mean, extraordinary to see Ismail Haniyeh's reaction there to his family members being killed. Frankly, very little reaction. Yeah, very matter of fact. Um, and at the end of that that video clip that was released, he was asked whether he wants to continue the visit. He looks like he's in a hospital, um, and he's asked whether he wants to continue on the visit, and he says yes. Um, we don't know exactly which hospital it is. Um, I assume somewhere in Doha. But a very matter of fact reaction when he hears a voice note saying that his three sons and some of his grandchildren have been killed. I can only assume that there's a number of factors behind that. 
one that he probably assumed that his sons would be targeted by the Israeli military at some point. And perhaps he did not want to give the Israelis satisfaction of uh, any kind of dramatic reaction on camera. But as he has said, it if it was intended as a tactic to put pressure on Hamas to agree a deal, then, according to Hani at least, it won't work. Yeah, and, and uh, just going back to what we were talking about, um, Eid, I mean, not much of a, a celebration, frankly, not just in, in Gaza, the West Bank, but, but the, the, across the Muslim world this year. No, the, 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 what is going on in Gaza uh, was the shadow that hung over the, the holy month here. If you're looking at some um, positive signs, it was much quieter in Jerusalem than people might have feared it would be. Hamas, before Ramadan started, called for Palestinians to rise up and storm Al-Aqsa, uh, referring to um, the, the third most holy site in Islam here in Jerusalem. That, that didn't happen, and the numbers who were allowed to worship at Al-Aqsa Mosque in the compound Haram al-Sharif were, were severely limited. However, what we did see, I think it is fair to say, throughout the month, was that the police here in Jerusalem did handle it pretty well. There were very, very few moments of violence um, through, through the Holy Month, so I think that is a positive. But generally speaking, people were very subdued, very sombre, very hard for them to, to celebrate Ramadan or celebrate Eid when they know what is going on really not very far from here in Gaza. Ali, uh, as always, thank you so much uh, for bringing us up to date. Now, don't go anywhere. We've got lots more coming up after the break. Uh, we will be finding out more about WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Um, we understand that he may be close uh, to being uh, freed. Uh, we have heard from President Joe Biden, who says that America is considering a request by Australia uh, to drop the prosecution of Assange. So stay with us for that. In order to affect policy change, we need good scientific foundation for our campaigning work. And so I'm very pleased to say that Andrew Knight and Emily Davis reviewed 42 pieces of published scientific peer-reviewed literature looking at the health and welfare of tigers, in particular kept in circus environments. Um, they looked at several things. They looked at their nutrition, their environment, behavioural interactions, their health and their mental health too. And they found that all of these were unsurprisingly compromised by the small enclosures, the constant travelling, the inaccessibility of, of proper food, as you've mentioned, the exposure to loud noises and, and crowds crowds, exposure to other animals too. Um, and this was very clearly as a result of their uh, you know, investigation, not an environment where we should continue to keep tigers. Now, obviously in the UK, um, this has been phased out, but I'm very sad to say that across Europe, we still see a large number of big cats being kept in circuses and it's a, a serious issue. Well, constant campaigning over many years, lots of agencies got together and pointed out the inadequacies of you know, our ability to keep animals when they were travelling like this. Um, they're significantly compromised. So, you know, when you think that a tiger, for instance, in the course of its day in the wild would roam over 50 square kilometres um, and its exercise uh, area when it's in a travelling circus is a few square metres, it was never going to work. And, you know, Wales jumped first and then we had changes in um, Scotland, Northern Ireland, England the last to move, but we're not going to see wild animals in travelling circuses in the UK. But as I say, unfortunately, in Germany, in France, in Spain, these are still very common. And some of these animals um, end up in the UK because they're being rescued. Um, we see that they have been declawed. The mutilation of, 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 of circus uh, animals is also frequent. They cut their claws off to make it safer, of course, when they're handling them. They saw their teeth off. And this instigates long-term health difficulties.
Welcome back to the program. I want to talk next about Julian Assange, yes, the WikiLeaks founder, who the UK spent more than £13 million on protecting during his time in the Ecuadorian embassy and before he was sent to Belmarsh prison. Well, now it seems he may be about to get released. President Joe Biden has said America is considering a request by Australia to drop the prosecution of Assange. He was facing extradition to the US from the UK on espionage charges over the leaking of confidential military documents. Here's what the president said a little earlier. Uh, do you have a response to Australia's request that you end Julian Assange's prosecution? We're considering. We're considering. So you heard Joe Biden there say we're considering it. Well, two weeks ago, I spoke to Julian's wife, Stella, just after she had just heard that the UK courts would delay their decision on her husband's extradition to America. Just have a listen to what she had to say to me. There is no assurance that the U.S. can give that will keep Julian safe from what he is exposed to. The U.S. Um, government has said in, under oath that it intends to discriminate against him on the basis of his nationality, um, that he is not entitled to constitutional protections under the First Amendment, and uh, the UK courts have asked the US government to contradict these submissions by US prosecutors. The UK courts have also identified the death penalty as a real possibility. And that is obviously your greatest fear and, and that of Julian's. Julian risks losing his life either to the death penalty or to being assassinated because we know that the US administration under the Trump administration previously had already plotted to assassinate him. And uh, also, if he is taken to the United States, he will be placed under conditions of extreme isolation, which could and will drive him to commit suicide. What would you now like to see? Obviously, you'd like to see this case dropped and for Julian to be free. What are your hopes for, for the future going forward? Well, we have two little boys. Uh, they're five and six years old, and they need their father. Every day that Julian is in prison is a day that they're deprived of their father and their father's love and affection and guidance. That was uh, Stella Assange speaking to me a, a few weeks ago. I'm joined now in the studio uh, by Kristen Raffinson, the editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks. Thanks very much, Kristen, for, for joining us here on the programme. We're just hearing there uh, from uh, Stella Assange, someone you know very well, you've worked very closely with. I mean, she talked about the fact that his life would be at risk if he was extradited to the United States. Extraordinary tonight that we're hearing President Biden saying that they're considering it, they're cons considering dropping the prosecution. Yes, I think it's extraordinary to hear this uh, for the first time now from the, uh, Joe Biden, that uh, this is uh, being considered, the uh, uh, urgent request from the Australian administration, led by Anthony Albanese, Prime Minister, that the United States drops the charges. Of course, we uh, will uh, hope to see in the coming days, and I hope the press corps in the White House and in the halls of power in Washington, D.C., to get clarification of what this means. But the consideration is, is, is a good step. Uh, I would say, of course, the natural outcome of that consideration is to drop the charges. This is a case that should never have been brought in the first place. You say never should have been brought in the first place, but what we see now is 10 years of this, and, I mean, just when you look at the protection, police protection that was provided at the Ecuadorian embassy, £13 million was spent. And, and we've seen 10 years of this, Julian Assange, five years in, in prison. It's quite extraordinary to now reach this point. Yes, it's extraordinary that, that all this money was spent on keeping uh, Julian inside uh, the embassy where he sought legitimately asylum and was granted asylum by the then President Rafael Correa. Uh, so you cannot blame that cost on Julian Assange. You should uh, question your own government for why they spent all this extraordinary amount of money on this. Uh, why now? Well, it's not been more than 10 years. It's been 14 years, seven years inside the Ecuadorian embassy in uh, the centre of London behind Harrods. And now, tomorrow, April 11th, will mark a five-year anniversary of uh, his uh, stay in Belmas prison. He's been locked up an innocent man, for five years tomorrow. 
The US government, um, various administrations said that what Julian Assange did put many lives at risk. The fact that he released all of these documents and you are uh, now you know, running WikiLeaks. What, what's your view on it? What are you guys working on now? What are you doing? Well, putting lives at risk is an empty, are empty words, and uh, you don't have to take my word for it. Actually, the witness from the Pentagon in the uh, trial of Chelsea Manning before court martial had to admit in that those proceedings that they had no instance of any bodily harm being uh, as a result of of the publication of the material based on her uh, whistleblowing leaks. So there has not been any harm. The only harm is to the reputation of the United States because uh, Julian Assange and Wikileaks exposed to war crimes and wrongdoing, exactly what journalists are supposed to do. Chelsea Manning has been treated quite differently to, to Julian Assange. Would you agree with that? Well, her, her sentence, she was sentenced to 35 years in prison. Her sentence was commuted by the uh, Obama, uh, when he left office, President Obama. Uh, by the administration that Biden uh, was a part of. And it, in that context, we should consider that uh, the Obama administration did look into the possibility of bringing forth an indictment against Julian Assange, but did decide not to, for the risk they would put uh, local media, the, the New York Times and other legacy media or the mainstream media, into jeopardy uh, for confrontation with the First Amendment. So the decision by the Obama administration, because of what they called the New York Times problem, decided not to go ahead. It was Donald Trump's administration that brought the charges against Julian. And that is the legacy that Biden has now been uh, stuck with. And the only thing to end this political, politically motivated persecution, because there's no doubt in my mind that Julian is a political prisoner, is to take a political decision to end this. You're planning on seeing Julian Assange tomorrow, potentially. How is he? I mean, when I spoke to Stella, she said that it's having such a massive toll onto his mental health and, and his well-being. Well, you, anybody can imagine what kind of an uh, effect it has on an individual to be locked up in this uh, maximum security prison here in southeast London for five years after having spent seven years in a small apartment that it was the embassy of Ecuador. Of course, it has taken a toll. And the medical evaluation that has been presented to the courts here in the extradition proceedings um, confirmed that and have, has not been contested. He is in a very dire situation. And uh, this situation has to come to an end because five years are five years too many and we need to end this now. Kristen, uh, thank you so much for joining us here in the studio. Thanks for having me. Now, don't go uh, anywhere. We've got much more coming up uh, after the break. We'll be speaking to our US correspondent, Mark Stone, about a powerful animal tranquilizer, which has plagued cities in the United States. And it's now made its way to the UK. Stay with us for that.
Welcome back. A powerful animal tranquilizer, which has been plaguing cities across the United States, has now made its way to the UK. Xylazine, dubbed Tranq or the zombie, uh, zombie drug, rots the skin of those who use it and was designated as an emerging threat by the White House. Researchers at King's College London have found it's now circulating in the UK's illegal drug market and has already been linked to one death. Well, let's go straight to our US correspondent, Mark Stone, who has seen the impact of the drug firsthand in Philadelphia last year. Mark, thank you so much for, for joining us. As we said, you've seen the impact firsthand. I mean, it's quite extraordinary when you think about the fact that it, it sort of rots the skin of those who use it. Yeah, it's, it's truly awful. It, it is an animal tranquilizer. It's cut uh, with other drugs uh, here in America, predominantly fentanyl, uh, which is the the drug of the moment uh, in cities across the United States. Uh, and the impact it has is devastating. I have to say, I'm not surprised at all uh, that it is now being seen in the UK. When we were first looking at the impact of this drug, this drug uh, in America, uh, officials, uh, state level officials were, uh, were in Philadelphia, already saw it, saw themselves as the canary in the coal mine. They were advising other cities across America. Uh, and they told us that uh, that they would be happy to advise, advise other countries as well, because there was no question it would, it would get there. Have a look at uh, this reflection um, of, a, of a film we made almost exactly or just over a year ago in Philadelphia to get a sense of the impact this drug is having. And it's because the, the trank is, is, is so much more addictive than anything else you've, else you've taken before. Yeah, and it's just a mixture of it all, like the fentanyl with the trank. Now you have a co-occurring, you know, two different opiates, you know, and one that really isn't even supposed to be consumed by humans. These are not injection site wounds. Like these are all wounds like other than injection <clears throat> site. This is kind of a common presentation that we've seen with these types of wounds with like with the, the fentanyl and train is that these kind of like random pustules and then they just they kind of erode through the skin really r rapidly. So it, like you're probably fine one day and then all of a sudden exactly. these were there, right? Exactly. This is me shooting right here and it like Goes to, it's like trying to come out my skin. So you're shooting on on one side, but but the the injury yeah. is on the other side yeah. as a result of the the drug. Yeah, I had surgery um already on them. Yesterday I was crying all day. I don't know what to do. I really don't. Our brain tells us to breathe. Their brain tells them to breathe and get drugs, or you will die. Like, that's the kind of, a, maybe not those exact words, but like, that's the feeling that they have. If I don't have this, I'm going to die. I'm going to be so sick. And like, it, if it was easy, we wouldn't have this problem. Every day that I'm out here longer, it's another piece of, you know, my values, my soul, my yeah, essence yeah, of who I am is getting lost. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah. it's like, how much can you take? And then you see these people here that are just a shell. There's just hey, nothing there, there anymore. You just, and you know that, you know, they are living two minutes at a time of their life, like just to get that use and that's all that matters. And I'm so lucky that there's still more of me left. And it's literally decimating the American youth. You know, it's just the uh, quiet killer going on right now. I mean, Mark, that, that's so disturbing uh, to see. And, and as we were saying, the White House has said this is an, an emerging threat and, and it's already entered uh, the illegal drug trade here in the UK. Um, and I guess, you know, it's unclear whether, whether this country is ready for it. It doesn't feel like the United States has fully grappled with it. Uh, not at all. The United States uh, has not grappled with it. They haven't even grappled with the fentanyl crisis. And and uh, and be clear that what we're seeing now is, is fentanyl cut uh, with with xylazine, creating this this con co this cocktail trank. Uh, and uh, the reason that fentanyl is being cut with trank, what the, the reason dealers are doing that is because trank is much cheaper. It's sorry, xylazine is much cheaper, easier to get hold of, and so. Uh, Increasingly, the, the, the uh, experts are finding that the, 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 the breakup of the drug that people are taking, there's much more trank in it than there is fentanyl because the fentanyl is, is, is harder to get, get hold of. And that's what's happening uh, in the UK as well. And I spoke to, to, to Ronnie, who you saw in that little clip there uh, from Angels in Motion, this extraordinary charity doing what they can. And she said that in, in Philadelphia now, um, the, they are discovering uh, those people that come in for treatment. Uh, the, the drug that they are taking is almost completely 
completely xylazine, very little uh, of any other uh, more regular street drug uh, within the concoction. Uh, and as you saw, it, it's when they inject it, the, the wounds are in a different part of, the, of, their, of their body, often the opposite side of the limb uh, that they're injecting. And the... The medics just don't know how to treat these wounds. Uh, it's, it's absolutely frightening. I mean, it, it's clear to say that, that Britain is no, nowhere near in the state that, that, that America is in. Um, but if you see how quickly it's spread across America and how addictive it, it is, uh, I think British and European health authorities need to, to sit up and get advice from their, their counterparts over here. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Mark, thank you so much uh, for your reporting there. Now, uh, stay with us because we have something really special coming up. Uh, you may have heard his name. Uh, he is called uh, Russ Cook, and he has run along the entire length of, of Africa. He did it on um, Sunday. We have him here live in the studio. Stay with us for that. And on Sky News at 10, the moment a Hamas leader found out his sons had been killed in an Israeli airstrike. And we have a special report on the thousands of failed asylum seekers still in the country. More on that with me, Anna Botting, at 10. I'm Martin Brunt, and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. My most memorable story was, and still is, the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Please, please do not hurt her. Please give our little girl back. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. For detectives, the first 48 hours after a murder are crucial in the search for clues. The public expects them to find Jill Dando's killer soon. The British detectives are planning to meet forensic experts, academics and even witch doctors. I remember the grimmest case, the Soham murders of schoolgirls Holly and Jessica. I felt I can't undo what's happened, but I can help explain it. Come on. Ian Huntley was arrested and charged within a fortnight of the murders. I've never murdered anyone. I've never raped anyone. What am I in jail for? The parole board has to decide if Bronson needs to be kept locked up for the safety of the public. My biggest challenge was to persuade a jail diamond thief to answer my letters. Martin Brunt, Sky News at the Old Bailey. Crawford and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place for news.
Welcome back. Most people would consider running a marathon at the peak of their fitness, but not Ross Cook. The British endurance athlete, nicknamed the hardest geezer, completed a 9,941 mile run along the entire length of Africa on Sunday. It's taken him nearly a year to do it, and he's raised over £870,000 for charity during the epic challenge. Well, I'm glad to say the hardest geezer joins me now live in the studio. Hi. Hi, so Hi, good everyone. to see you. I mean, it, it's taken you a year to get to our studio. That's how long the, the run was. Yeah. How are you? I'm great. Yeah, no, I'm buzzing <laughs> to be back. Um, just, yeah, loving being back in the UK. And in that time, I mean, did you, when you went out, was your beard this long? Or? It wasn't, no, the, the barnet is a bit of a mess right now. Do need to, I'm just looking at myself there. I'm, wow. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm going to get a haircut imminently, I think. Bad. I mean, just just tell us first of all. I mean, this isn't the first time you've done something sort of like this. No. It, 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 you know, why did you decide to do it? I mean, you, you did it basically for charity, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, a, a big reason is the, is the charity. We've obviously raised 170 grand for charity now, which is uh, which is wicked. Um, but also, you know, I just want to. When I'm an old man, I want to be able to look back and say I had a tear up and that I made the most of this life and want to have stories for the grandkids and all this kind of stuff. So just, you know, trying to get about it as much as possible, really. OK, so tell us where you started and where you ended up and what was going through your mind when you were doing it. <laughs> so <laughs> I started at the most southern tip of the continent in South Africa, uh, Cape Orgullis. Ended up in Tunisia, the most northern tip of Africa, in uh, Ras Angela, I believe it's called. And, yeah, I mean, that we had so many challenges, hurdles to overcome, you know, Congo rainforest, Sahara desert, loads of countries, 16 countries. So there was always something to be thinking about or a problem to solve. So I was mostly thinking about that a lot. Um, but, you know, I was on long runs every day. So I'd be thinking about all sorts, to be honest. Mostly on your own? Yeah, yeah, pretty much like 99.9% .9 of it was on my own, yeah. Yeah, and, I, you know, it wasn't all without its... You talked about some of the challenges, but we're talking mm. about... Robbery as well, yeah. a visa issue. Yeah, Talk yeah. us through that. Uh, yeah, so uh, we were robbed at gunpoint in Angola. Um, we've, we had a few different visa issues, lost passports and um, couldn't get into Algeria, it was, but we managed to get that solved in the end. With, we put a thing out on social media and loads of people came to help us and then it ended up the president of Algeria sorted us out a visa, which was incredible. And we had a, such a great time in Algeria as well. Um, so, yeah, like, it was... <laughs> so much happened, I can't lie, it was crazy. I mean, it kind of slightly reminds me of sort of Forrest Gump, where yeah, you said, yeah. you know, for 365 days, I just I just ran. Yeah. Were you just running the, the entirety of the time? Or were you having, were you were obviously having moments to, to sleep and eat as well. Yeah, yeah, no, so I'd, um, I ran on average 46 kilometres a day um, throughout the whole year. So, so basically a marathon every day. Yeah, slightly more than a marathon a day. Um, but then, you know, in between that, we, we, we were putting loads of, we were making like content and stuff. So we were doing stuff on social media and making YouTube videos and documentary and like had a team. So there's loads going on. Um, but yeah. Any moments of, of sort of regret where you sort of midway you thought, what, what am I doing and am I going to finish this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was, I think I was, at, I was speaking to the guys at the running chat earlier and I was like, actually, for like the, the last seven months were so brutal. I was like, in my head, I was, I was finding it hard to conceive of this thing ever ending. I was just, wait, you know, wake up, run, eat, sleep, run. And, you know, every now and again, the country would change. We're like, oh, now I'm in the desert. But it kind of felt like this elusive thing. I was on the road for so long that this finish line was just like some mystical object that I was never going to get my hands on. But time's relentless and, you know, here we are. And sort of what aspect or part of the rain, uh, uh, the run, did you sort of really enjoy and find really kind of, you know... So much, you know, like, there, there was... I think one of the best parts was the amount of people that we met that were just so kind to us, um, sh like, sharing those cultures, learning about all these different parts of Africa that, like, not many people will really ever go to um, was really cool. And, you know, every country we went to, there was people that would, you know, either take us into their houses or feed us or help us out with X, Y, Z things that we had going on, which was like really incredible um, experience to be able to like see that kind of humanity everywhere. You know, it's, it's a beautiful thing. 
And what about the impact on your body? I mean, did you have a, a doctor with you uh, or, or, you know, were you sort of doing anything to sort of repair your body every day? Because it is, as you say, just a little over a, a marathon, do you? Yeah. Um, nah, no doctor. Uh, my body is... My body... I've had three days of not running now, so my body feels quite all right. But that for the whole year, my body's been messed up. Um, had injury, every injury you can imagine. Uh, yeah, it was really brutal. I, like, it feels so weird now because my leg's kind of starting to feel a bit normal again and I, I couldn't remember what that felt like. What, what was it feeling like? Was Just it... everything was so sore, the muscles are so tight, everything's really fatigued. Like, my hip flexors have been absolutely burnt to pieces for, for ages. You know, like, calf, my, every, like, every muscle in my leg, my back's been... I injured my back on, like, two, day 200, never really recovered. So, yeah, it was painful, can't I? Very painful. And what about your, your family, your friends, your girlfriend? Yeah. Or, uh, you know, when you were robbed, were, were they sort of saying to you, you know what, just come home? <laughs> <laughs> I, they, they don't even say stuff like that to me anymore because they just know it's not happening. Like, um, my, yeah, my girlfriend, we didn't, I didn't see her for 14 months, but you know, she's sat out there now and uh, she's been super supportive the whole time. Everyone has, like, my friends and family, we saw them at the finish line and we had, like, a nice meal together the other night and I'll go back and see them in a couple of days. So, yeah, no, like, it's, it's great, yeah. There were a, a bunch of supporters, actually, close yeah. to the finish line. They, they ran that last bit with you, including yeah. our, our sports uh, uh, Rob, yeah, Rob yeah. Harris, yeah. I'm just going to show, show that picture of Rob trying to interview you at... As you as you uh, ran, uh, yeah, we could see Look you there with the go. bike. <laughs> what a man! Um, yeah, we, we sort of you suddenly got there, and all these people are there, including the press. Yeah. Did you realise that there was this moment? No, nah, not a clue. Like I couldn't believe it when I rolled up there. So many people, um, yeah, cameras, and loads of people asking me questions. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you, like uh, you said, you, you did this for, for charity. What charity can people still donate? Yes, so we're trying to get it to a million. We're nearly there, um, raising money for the running charity, which we try and engage young people in sport, um, especially running. We work, we work here in the UK. And then I'm also raising money for Sandblast, which do work in one of the biggest refugee camps in Africa. They deliver uh, educational and cultural programs there. And what's next for you? I've got 20 uh, seconds. <laughs> um, probably some ice cream. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'll sit down, relax, and then we might have another challenge at some you point. You actually had some strawberry daiquiris that night. Yeah, I had, had a strawberry daiquiri, had like four beers, <laughs> sent me a bit over the edge. But, yeah, no, we're, we're all good now, yeah. Oh, well, Ross, we're, we're really grateful uh, that you've come and, and shared your story Thanks here with us after me. a really long run. Thank you so much. Wicked. Now, that's it for tonight's programme. News at 10 is next uh, with more on the strike in Gaza, which killed the children of a senior Hamas leader. I'll be back again tomorrow. Good night. Thank you so much. You're still...